on va continuer avec euh, le commerce composable, Commerce Tools, où on a le plaisir d'accueillir Michael Scholz, qui vient spécialement des US, accompagné de Nicolas Pastorino de chez Interflora. Bonsoir. Hello, everyone. It's an immense pleasure to be here on stage today. Um, this concludes the keynotes for this conference. This concludes the keynotes for today. And I think we're all looking forward to the evening festivities and celebrations. So we really want to hope to inspire you in this session. We want to share inspiration and optimism around composable commerce. We want to share ideas on how to apply artificial intelligence in the context of composable commerce. But we also want to provide a pragmatic approach as it comes to artificial intelligence, generative AI. Um, but we also want to share how you can protect your brand, things like privacy, security, because I think that's also top of your mind as you embark on this digital transformation. Um, my name is Michael Schultz. I've been with Commerce Tools for three years. I run product and customer marketing here, but have been in the industry for about 20 years on the vendor side, on the partner side, also working with customers on digital transformation projects. And I'm joined by Nicola today, the chief product officer and chief digital officer of Interflora. Would you like to introduce Ye yourself? Yes, I'm really happy to be here. Um, we're, um, I'm leading e-commerce and technology for Interflora as a group. Um, Interflora is a well-known brand. Uh, most of you probably know it. We're operating in 140 countries. Um, our group operates in Europe. We're the pan-European consolidator. That's uh, 300 people, 4 million old a year, uh, 7,000 florists, um, our main partners. And we're going to tell a few stories of what we did in the past, uh, in the past years, uh, along with Michael tonight. Awesome. And we're where we're sitting between you and the operative, so we hope yeah. you're going to stay focused. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as we're heading this fireside chat, we really want to initially also talk about what does it even mean? What is composable commerce? Because I think headless composable commerce is still very new to this market, uh, to Europe, some might even claim in America, it's, it's a new trend. Um, and I think if you look at this picture here on, this, on the slides be behind me, you're seeing the first iterations of Amazon and eBay. And in those times, you really only had the desktop experience. And if you think about commerce platforms, and I'm thinking about the Oracles, the ATGs, the Salesforces, the SAPs, the Hybrises of the world, all of them were founded or IPO'd in kind of like the late 90s and early 2000s, even before there was even a different channel. So all of these architectures that power these uh, large companies only had the desktop experience in mind. And so when you think about the term headless, it really means that you're decomposing the front and the back end experience. You're decoupling the, the experiences because as you had the iPhone come out in 07, as you're adding social, TikTok, you name it, you're adding additional channels. So it's, it's much more flexible and the experience can be greater to shoppers when you have a decomposed or a um, headless experience. And so composable commerce, what that really means is it's just the next iteration of that because you're not just only decoupling the front and the back end, but you're com decomposing everything, your search, your personalization, your content management, even your commerce platform, everything is fair game. And so we're going to talk about this. And what we've seen over the last two, two uh, five years, really, is there's only two realities or two truths. Um, the number one is really the notion that change is the only constant. And the other um, fact is really around the future um, is really um, unpredictable. And so with these two, I guess, notions or realities or truth, I think we're looking at these monolithic platforms in a way that they cannot handle the, the rate of change or the type of change that we're seeing in the market. So that's why we sort of come to, to composability. And so as we're, as we're looking at that, we're looking to, to move from these very static monolithic applications to amazing experiences, whether it's wearables, whether it's amazing designs, in-store experiences. So from a brand, from a merchant perspective at, at Interflora, 
how do you define composable? How do you even sell composable internally? And what do you see the main traits to be? Yeah, we've, we've, um, we've built our own, our own stories around composable. And if we fell into composable commerce by accident, we didn't know it was called this way, right? Um, and the, the way we entered is uh, when in 2021, we decided to form a group from uh, you know, different uh, portfolio companies we had. So created the marketing and technology function centrally and wanted to deploy an e-commerce platform for all of our entities. It can be called a replatforming. And the, um, the main requirements was, uh, the main requirement was to en enforce business continuity. No big bang, right? We, we want to make sure that business is at least as good during and after the move. Um, and the only answer to that from a, let's say, an architecture standpoint was composable. We had eight different countries with eight different uh, platforms, eight different ways of doing e-commerce, and eight different mindsets and philosophies in the teams. Um, so we wanted to come with a very shallow product and adapt it, plug it in every single business unit in the fastest possible time, and then iterate, go a bit deeper once we had done the first layer. But the first layer was meant to prove value and bring, uh, in our case, additional online conversion. Um, so Composable was, uh, was the only way to do that, basically, without breaking the tools and our toys. Uh, so in itself, this is, a, this is a, a trait, right? It's a great tool for rapid transformation, right? And now that we're in it uh, on a daily basis, um, we could say that, that our experience, at least, it's, um, it, 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 it gives a company a rapid, low-risk, low-investment adaptation capability. Right. So you can do very targeted changes in the shopping experience without having a big looming risk of breaking everything. Right. And you can go really fast on that. Um, we have tons of examples, but one of them is saying, OK, we at some point realized based on customer feedback that um, when you offer a bouquet, uh, you want to give a very nice card to people, what we call a premium card. People would be able before to write a small message on a very standard non-fancy card. Um, and people would be willing to pay for a premium card. So entering to that, we could, you know, um, thanks to Composable Commerce, quickly prototype that in a matter of days, put that online to measure market traction first. It was not a finished product by any mean. It was very just a change on the front end. And we could prove value quite immediately, thanks to also more data available through mm -hmm. Composable Commerce architecture. And based on that data, make a decision to go forward. So invest more to make it to make it happen for real, right? Invest in a big printer, in a warehouse, um, design fancy cards and go for it, um, and which could be then deployed in a matter of a few weeks afterwards. So that's a very concrete example of you know, targeted changes with low risk and uh, immediate, uh, immediate value. And this is also an example of how this transformed how the company operates. Um, Along with changes to, uh, towards composable commerce, we really reinforced the product management discipline, um, as, in, as in contemporary version of it, where we have product managers focusing on the problems we want to solve for a customer and have small cross-discipline teams with UX people, engineers, uh, a product manager, very focused on the one given problem to solve, not just a list of tasks in the backlog. So what is the problem you want to solve? And you have hands. Uh, full range on it, you can do whatever you want. You know what to measure and when. So we call that the squads, right? So it also brought about an organizational transformation, mm -hmm. which, which we call then uh, the focus on time to money, right? It helped us focus on not time to market, but really time to money. The, the time between an ID starts existing and the moment it creates structural additional value for the company. And in between those two points, points in time, there's oftentimes a decision based on the da data saying it just does not work. So we just put that away, we move on to the next ID. Right? Um, so that's another trait, I think, if we go yeah. full on of, uh, of what composable commerce brings from a business standpoint and an organizational standpoint. And you, you're mentioning three amazing points. I'm thinking organizational design, I'm thinking complexity, I'm thinking total cost of ownership. I think in, in, in your role and as you're sort of um, being the ambassador internally of, of this movement. I think there's a lot of myth out there in the market that following this approach actually is more complex, takes an army of developers and engineers, and also is indeed more expensive. I mean, do you hear this internally, externally as well? We do hear this, uh, and we wanted to forge our own opinion on that. Um, 
in the aftermath, after having done the, the calculations, uh, total cost of ownership is actually lower, right? Um, and it's based on a simple principle, which is you pay for the value you need at a given point in time. So you don't need to have a Rolls Royce to start learning how to drive. You can start with a very crappy car. Um, and that's this very ID, uh, which is, of course, you know, costs nothing compared to a Rolls Royce. And I'm not, not saying this because we're in Monaco, right? It's just the overall example. Uh, so this is, this is in our understanding, why total cost of ownership is actually lower. Um, and regarding the army developers, um, it really depends on how you tackle this ID. Um, you can enter via the small door, the back door on that, um, do limited scope changes and prove value. And then, of course, if it works um, in any known business, value creation is usually heard, right? So if this works, then you can naturally deploy uh, out to the entire company. If it doesn't work, then Done. Right. And so w when you're looking at these, these cost savings, are you like putting them in your back pocket and you're happy about it and putting it in the bank? Or are you like reinvesting that for new features, new initiatives, new strategic priorities, or, or both? Overall, overall, I guess it depends on the company mentality. We tend to be fortune ahead, so we reinvest. And we, we see that as an as actual free bonus to move forward faster, so we can do more investment, more tests. Um, so that's our approach, right? Mm -hmm. But anyways, that's, that's some headroom that is created. Yeah. Right? And yeah. the last point you brought up was around organizational design. Do you think that an organization has to change for adopting a composable commerce approach? Or will it make due? Or? I understand that might, that might scare people off. Uh, I don't think you have to, right? You can probably adopt a new type of um, technical architecture and, and, and go away with it with a pre pre-existing organization. Um, our take was that if you really want to get the best out of it, uh, you'd, you'd rather do the full change. Uh, maybe not instantly, right? But once you've proven value, uh, you get a better leverage by doing the change. Uh, th that's what we saw, actually. Um, but also because we're in full transparency, we're, 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 we're a traditional company. We've been here for one century. So as you might expect, there is organizational legacy, technical legacy, cultural legacy. Uh, if we were at the NVB starting with uh, composable commerce, the organization would immediately be mapping uh, right. composable commerce mindset, you know, I guess. And so you're speaking to more agility and like an ability to jump on new innovation, new trends. What, what are the, some of the current trends that you're seeing, some of the like low hanging fruits, some of the more ambitious goals and trends that you see out there? Um, I can give what we, what we think, right? It's by no means uh, a Forrester or Gartner presentation, but um, we think in e-commerce that this year, like maybe the previous years as well, um, most of us are going to go back, uh, have to go back to the basics, as in um, make sure um, to have a very sharp view on profitability, maybe more than before. Um, it might go as far as rebalance, um, you know, traffic uh, mixes in order to make it more cost effective. Um, and the counterpart of that is work on, you know, brand, 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 brand. How do you make sure your brand exists? Brand uh, preference is getting higher every day. Uh, people mm -hmm. coming back after they had a first touch point with your experience or brand. Um, and in order to, you know, how do you cherish your customer? How do you build loyalty initiatives of any sort? Um, and in order to have that and make informed decision, you will need probably high quality data more and more, which is one of the byproducts of composable commerce architectures. Yeah, can you maybe double click into that? I don't, I don't know if the audience really like, can put itself in, in the shoes of understanding why data is so important because of the different architectural views. Like, how, how would you explain that to like, my five-year-old son? <laughs> I, I, would, I would speak to yours, uh, just like mine. The, like, um, by nature, if you plug uh, in composable commerce architecture, you have more different tools that uh, are meant to respond to a norm, APIs, mm -hmm. exposing uh, their features and their data sets so that you can export data and use it in a data warehouse or anything. So it, it is likely that by nature, the tools you're using in a composable commerce architecture are better at showing data that is most likely cleaner than what yeah. you could extract by hand from a monolith before. So the byproduct of it is that um, at least that's what we did. We built our data platform that is fed every minute, sometimes by data coming out of the parts mm -hmm. of our architecture. And this, this is 
this is what brought about cultural change, really. Uh, we have data now. So um, let's say the balance between, um, and no offense, I call that incantations that we see in many business in decision making and data back decision making has really shifted, mm -hmm. right? Um, I've been quoting uh, Jim Barksdale uh, many, many times, which is the former CEO of Netscape. So some of you um, might know him. Uh, he, he used to say back in the days already, if we have data, let's, let's look at data. If all we have are opinions, let's go with mine. This is the kind of you know, explanation of, you know, um, right. we'd rather have data, right, to make yeah. informed decisions, and this is really enab enabling speed. Data, when properly you know, shown, and if it's clean data, if you can trust it, um, is a no-brainer, usually, for decision-making. And in terms of current trends, I mean, we couldn't be sitting on this stage without mentioning artificial intelligence. Is there anything, any, any war stories that you can share, any sort of efforts that Interflora is currently undertaking? Uh, we, yeah, we can share quite a few of our, and again, this is by no means a generalization, and the session before was, seemed to be very expert. Um, the way we kind of internalized it was saying, um, uh, the mantra was, you're not competing with AI as a person, as an employee. You're competing with another marketeer at, at a competitor using AI, right? So that's the approach, right? See that as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Your job is not at risk uh, unless you really neglect that part of the world. And this is a paradigm shift. That's also something we've stated. We, have very, we had very little top-down um, narratives on that, mm -hmm. except those ones. Like, this is a paradigm shift. We need to start today. Um, we don't need to overinvest, right? So do the usual stuff, play around, uh, test and learn, mm -hmm. prove value. And if this is proving value, just continue. Otherwise, you ditch and you move on to the next ID. With one cave ad, which was about security and IP, intellectual property rights, uh, no matter what we say or hear, um, if you feed into ChatGPT or anything, confidential data at some point, it will become public. It is likely. It might happen, right? So we've been very clear on that, saying, okay, play around, but to, s to some extent, right? Until some, some limit. Um, and so we started grassroots. So we played around with very basic tools, so a premium account of ChatGPT. Um, one of the war stories we have is um, we have a very golden, uh, cool golden nugget in the group called Cado.com. So it's personalized or very personalized gift that, you know, that you can offer. And we got signals from um, market demand and requests, uh, search queries, basically, that we did not answer, like, um, I am searching for a birthday gift for my father who is 60 years old and who is a fan of, fan of fishing. Uh, that's a long query, which you, we tend to get through vocal search more and more, right? So the length of search is increasing. That's long tail type of approach, and we, we were not positioned on that. Neither were mm -hmm. most of our competitors, by the way. So how do we answer to that with the six people we have in the team? Well, it, it involves you know, creating as many new products as there are hobbies, so maybe 500 times 10 core products, uh, times 100 birthdays or ages, right? So that's becoming a very volumic type of stuff, which is, yep. in our scale, not humanly possible. And that's where the team said, okay, we're, that's an opportunity. Uh, how can we build product detail pages or PDPs and pr actual products that would answer those long tail type of things? So they played around with, um, a mix of fill in the blanks type of text that was really, really singular, right? Mm -hmm. Because we wanted that for our customers. Mm -hmm. um, creating prompts, very advanced prompts, uh, programmatically, and then uh, requesting answers from ChatGPT, from both texts, and then we, we use another tool for picture creation. And so we, we ran the first, that we were very unsure about the uh, outcome, so we went from 2K references to 15K in three days, um, wow. and tried and put that to market. Um, and it kind of worked, uh, because the customers who were searching those things could see results, and they had actual gifts that were matching those requests, and they mm -hmm. bought them. Right. So that's, uh, that's and it, we had no data scientists. We had a f bit of programming, one Python engineer, Mm -hmm. um, chat GPT prompt testing, which actually means you play around for hours on it until you find a very singular output. That's nothing else than that. Yeah. <laughs> and we then scale it. Okay, awesome. And so you mentioned it was a grassroots effort, but where are you on this kind of like maturity curve now? Are you still like playing in the sandbox or are you putting in processes, guidelines? Are you using large language models? Like 
Where, where are you on that trajectory? We've, we've, um, we've not structured a, a, p a policy in the company for that yet. Um, but we've gone a bit further than that, right? Uh, so uh, we use two things. Productified AI that we see in quite a, quite a few of the tools we're using on a daily basis. So my acquisition team has been using, like many of you, I guess, Pmax and Broadmatch for uh, over a year now. And this, this, is, this has really changed their job, right? Uh, before, they were you know, curating a list of most appropriate keywords, etc. And this went quickly over to which keywords do you need to put negative, right? Which is, and how do you monitor that? And how do you play around with the, the AI engine? Uh, which is basically changing every day as well, and we're not necessarily n notified by Google when this changes. So you need to be monitoring that and understanding the, the way it works. Uh, we had the same for Photoshop in beta version, where you could prompt to create images or to create parts of images. So our studio, design studio uh, used that extensively. Right? Um, you see our products, they're very visual. That We, we put a lot of, um, of love in, in the product pictures and the, the, the lifestyle sceneries that we, we uh, we put together, and uh, this is really making a change in terms of conversion, but this is a huge amount of work, really huge, uh, even if we don't have so many products. Uh, so when we're going in photo shoots, we needed you know, to have two or three of them in order to have the proper set for a given temporary collection. Um, and this was divided by two by using uh, prompt engineering inside mm -hmm. um, graphic creation within Photoshop, right? It took a time for us to master that, but this really went through, and part of what you see there is, uh, is AI generated now. Oh, wow. I mean, it's interesting because we are also looking at it from, from, from our perspective as we're looking at this broader ecosystem of content, product information management, search, things of that, that nature, and we're really trying to understand and experiment of what are the best applications of Gen AI. And I think <clears throat> for me, and I would love to get your like, thoughts on this too, is Gen AI is good at creating content, text, um, but then we're also being reflective and we're just like, you know what, maybe this should be in the content management system or maybe that should sit in the product information management system. I think Gen AI is also very good at making decisions. So maybe in the payment space, in the fraud space, what, what, what are your thoughts? What are the best applications that you've seen so far? Um, that's, um, that's a very good question, right? We've, we've see, in many parts, we, we, see, we seem to think that Gen AI is very vertical still, right? Or AI overall still is vertical. Mm -hmm. We have not seen any tangible sign of, of existence of an called AGI, so, you know, um, um, of, um, uh, how do you call that? Artificial general intelligence, mm -hmm. which would be a clear game changer for companies, really. For now, we're using vertical aspects of it. So we use that in fraud management through suppliers, right? That's productified AI. Mm -hmm. We've improved fraud management, uh, thanks to checkout.com, through their AI that we've been tuning with them. Um, um, we've, we've talked about uh, graphical assets acquisition. In eMerge, we've not talked about that. This is a major change also. For, we've, we've been using Bloomreach and their AI. Um, to optimize uh, the way we present products on PLPs in a very automated way, uh, in a, with the ultimate idea of ha having a one-to-one a, a -one presentation of those PLPs to a given person, right? We're not there yet, but that's the target. Um, it's not per se Gen AI, but this is really something that we've, uh, we've experimented with, um, same as search, right? Mm -hmm. um, whether it should sit in a specific part of the ecosystem, um, we, don't, we don't really know because it's... Um, it's probably very experimental um, still. Um, we, one thing we think we're going to learn this year, um, forced kind of by Google, is uh, how to work with uh, mass market Gen AIs like SGE. Right? So the search results page is going to be, mm. uh, if they follow their schedule, dramatically changed uh, this year. Uh, it's already the case in the US and in 100 plus countries. Right? Um, they put that front and center in every person's life, right? So how, do we, how are we going to learn to exist there? Um, um, this is going to focus our attention versus where we should you know, put our, uh, Gen AI internally, which we've not figured out yet. Um, that's part of the trends that, that we really need to, that is, is scaring us a bit, honestly, right? How are we going to be existing on SGE? Uh, SCO is going to disappear, maybe. Mm -hmm. SCA traditional is going to be somewhere else. We don't know yet where, how they're going to monetize that, et cetera. You know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's interesting because when, when when I go back to this claim, like, oh, it, does this sit with the content management system or does this sit with the product information management system? 
we want to focus on how we can help you as a merchant or as a brand best. And so we want to make it abundantly easy to, to use commerce tools under the hood. And so we are looking into ways to how can we help you with the overall implementation integration. We're experimenting with things like can I create a prompt library to say, build me an integration to Bloomreach, build me an integration into your search vendor, build me an integration into your CMS. So it's all about how can you, how can you be avoiding a lot of the kind of like services overhead to build these integrations, which we all know, and we've suffered through migrations and upgrades and, and you name it. So how can we make that, that easy? And in fact, we, we did a trial internally. We went to adidas.com big sports brand, as you, as you can imagine. And we, we scraped the entire website within six hours and rebuilt it using ChatGPT. And we've sort of publicized how we, how we did that. And we time boxed it. We wanted only to spend six hours on this. And the only thing that we didn't end up doing is the text integration and the, and the payment checkout. But everything else, scraping the product catalog, building like the imagery to your point, um, and, and, and so we wanted to figure out, like, can we actually pull this off? And I would be curious, like, if integrations were like a thing of the past, I mean, integrations are not going to go away by any means, but if we could make it easier, like, what, what could you do next? Like, any future outlook in terms of what's possible? I think it would unleash the level of innovation we're playing with. Uh, essentially, we would save tons of times uh, in our engineering um, department, really. Um, and I've seen initiatives in the market, I think it's called marbling, where you basically give a prompt, uh, can be very extended, describing the type of application and business you want to build, you send this out, and they come back with a fully-fledged uh, wow. multi-layer application. I've not gone all the way to put that online and see whether it works for real, but that's, the intent is here, so at some point it, it will work, right? Um, meaning that's um, all, um, I would say, code production, um, is, is likely to be partly automated by Gen AI, right. and uh, it will be the developer's time to change their approach to their job, right? Mm -hmm. Not saying they're going to do QA only, quality assurance, but they will mostly then level up to thinking about architecture and then be able to prompt instead of coding. Um, that would be a tremendous industry shift given the, the amount of developers and engineers we have in this world, right? This would be a tremendous right. change. But this will also be a, a game changer for small businesses, trying to try <laughs> see the, the half full glass yeah. there, for small businesses who have a very limited investment or people capacity. Mm. It could help them with a big edge. And I want to come back to one of the things that you said around data. What do you think the, the correlation is between having data, having access to data, having data hygiene, and the applications of artificial intelligence? I, I would tag this as the number one prerequisite. And I think I've heard that in the conference before. Um, you know, that saying, you know, garbage in, garbage out. It works so much this way for AI, especially if you want to go as far as training your own models, mm -hmm. uh, which is probably something most of the mid to large size company are going to go into relatively short term. We've not gone that far yet, but we're preparing for that. Um, if you want to train your models, you have if, and if, if you don't have the ability to scrap the entire web and dark web like you know, Meta or OpenAI is doing, uh, because you can't pay for data centers, basically, yeah. uh, you need to have um, a, lower, a, slow, uh, a smaller set but very high quality of data. Um, it seems I've seen actors like uh, Dust, for example, in France, which is a fantastic company, um, trying to do that. So essentially, they're going to scrap your internal private company um, documents overall and try to get something out of it, making a prompt, a personal assistant for anybody in the company to yep. be able to leverage that. It seems experimental, um, but the pre number one prerequisite is really data quality. So it's a, it's a barrier to entry, I would, I would say, uh, to companies who are not equipped with a data platform yet, right, um, mm. basically. And I know we only have two minutes left, but any takeaways, any learnings, any pitfalls for the audience to avoid as they embark on this digital transformation, composable commerce, and, and also more and more adoption of artificial intelligence? Um, yeah, I can share. We've done uh, tons of mistakes. Um, so if I can avoid you uh, guys do them. Uh, for the first thing is uh, really, I call that fail fast. So uh, you know, it's the usual mantra, thing big build small, fail fast, or succeed fast, right? So go fast in your 
uh, initiatives uh, so that you can quickly know whether you're, you're on the right track or whether it's never going to work. Um, there are tons of things to try out, so fail fast, really. Um, it's a mindset thing. It's a cultural thing. It involves also that your company culture allows the right to fail, right? Uh, sometimes miserably, right? But you have to uh, adopt that. Um, the second one, which is a more of a discussion with CFOs and, and, and CEOs, is you need to strike the right level of investment uh, when you adopt a new tech, right? Um, exa example for AI, in our case, it's been a zero euro investment. You have the premium, uh, premium subscription to ChatGPT, so it's zero investment. But the time footprint has been very big. For the people, for time for the people to learn how to master prompt, which was, was a big prerequisite. In other cases, like composable commerce, the monetary initial investment might be a bit bigger. So how do you prove the value of that? How do you think of proving or forecast the, the business case for that? Um, another one, which is, I was telling about at the beginning, don't go big bang, it usually fails, right? So go progressive if you can, slice and dice the changes you want to do, and try and prove value at every step. Um, and also don't overlook cultural fit or organizational mm -hmm. readiness for a big change. Um, I've, I've heard stories of other companies where they said, okay, AI, let's go for it, let's go for it top down. And what, what, what the behavior of the people was fearing AI. So uh, most of the tests they did, the results were really moderate. So the conclusion, because, because there was no involvement of the, right. of the teams in there and people in a service type of work, you know, people are doing most of the work. Um, so you would conclude rapidly that AI is not for you. It's not working for you. It might not be true, right? Um, and also going all the way, and that can be the final words, and we're over time. Um, some tech changes are going to trigger um, organizational or structural mm -hmm. changes in the company organization. Um, that is not um, a CTO. It's not only a CDO type of duty to account for that. Uh, something you need to be ready as a as a next co or um, board uh, a board organ, um, if you want to go all the way, and that's usually where you leverage the most of it, right? We had this example at Interflora. I've heard stories of many other companies that went all the way, and it triggered deep changes in the organization. So that that's you know, yeah. tech is usually transformation. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you, Nicola. Thanks for everyone who came to the session um, before the evening celebrations. Thank Have you. Have a great day. <coughs>